So we're here with Dr. Pamela Weibel, a family physician, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the very tough subject of physician suicide rates. It's something that doesn't get nearly as much attention as it deserves, and so uh, Dr. Weibel's been speaking on this subject, researching it, and unfortunately tallying the uh, loss of life as a result of many different factors which she'll speak on today. Dr. Weibel, it's so good to have you on the show. Thanks for speaking with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Connor. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. So I guess I'll just start off by asking, you know, what really led you to start writing and speaking about physician suicides and this issue? Well, it was actually October 28th, 2012 at 6 p.m. or so, and I was sitting maybe 3 p.m., I believe, in the middle of this uh, memorial service for the third physician we had lost to suicide in my small town in Eugene, Oregon. And I was just blown away sitting there counting up the numbers of dead doctors who died under sort of suspicious circumstances or obvious suicides. And, you know, within a few minutes of counting these, sitting at this memorial service, I had 10 that I had counted, including both men that I dated in medical school. So I, I just felt as if I sort of stumbled onto a subject that needed an investigative reporter. <laughs> And I had a lot of energy on this topic, you know, not just because I've lost so many friends of mine, but I was suicidal myself as a physician in 2004. And I thought I was the only one, by the way. Right, absolutely. Um, and so I was reading through your website, and you noted that high doctor suicide rates have been reported since 1858, but yet the root causes still have not been addressed. And so, you know, after researching this and, and gaining these un very unfortunate personal experiences, um, you know, what are some of those root causes and how can we start to identify them? Well, the obvious one is that practicing medicine is a tough job. It's not like baking cakes and, you know, um, doing, uh, you know, party planning or something. We literally are watching people die and we're immersed in human suffering all day long and that absolutely has an emotional impact on the people who witnessed this, including the nurses and, and EMTs and others. And so there needs to be a recognition that we have vicarious trauma just from doing our jobs competently, right? So that's one issue, and we, don't, we should be getting on-the-job support, you know, like anyone should get if they witness a trauma, right? I mean, you, you can't just kind of go 30 years watching, you know, miscarriages as an OBGYN and telling people their baby is stillborn and think that you're going to be normal, you know, for in time for dinner, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> with your own kids in the evening. It's just not going to work that way, you know. So that's one thing. The other thing is that our training is actually rampant with human rights violations, including massive amounts of sleep deprivation, which is illegal in any other profession, would not be tolerated, you know, by the national transportation industry, you know, they would not allow pilots to fly planes after, you know, 28 hours on shift, um, probably no more than 14, I think. Um, and then same thing with truck drivers, you know, they, they would never be working the hours that residents are forced to work, sometimes over 100 hours a week, and they're forced to lie on their time cards, um, you know, to state that they're, you know, within the ACG and the, you know, uh, allowable 80 hours per week. And um, and even that is insane. That's like two full-time jobs. You know, even, you know, what they should be, quote-unquote, following 80 hours a week. Like, that, that's 80 hours a week doing really tough work. You know, like running ventilators and helping people at the edge of life and, you know, running codes. When you, 80, you know, when you haven't slept in 28 hours, does that make any sense? at all it actually it doesn't make sense that that is the case no absolutely it's it's an amazing feat that you know doctors can even still function at the level that they do right yeah i mean it's surprising there's not more suicides uh, given uh, the impossible situation we're in and also uh, the third element that makes it really terrible for physicians is that we're punished if we show any signs of being emotionally you know, transparent, um, you know, if we cry. I had a woman call me, a resident, who actually was written up for being unprofessional because she cried uh, wow. about a patient. You know what I mean? It's insane. And so the minute that we show any sort of, quote-unquote, weakness uh, via emotionality that would be normal in a situation of uh, telling somebody their husband died or child died, right, we actually are punished 
punished by being written up as unprofessional, punished by sometimes sending us to these physician health programs, uh, bad evaluations. So it's a really harsh, inhumane environment, I would say, that leads to people um, choosing suicide as their only way out. And by the way, the ones that don't choose suicide are sort of shells of their former selves. You know, you, like, like you look in their eyes and nobody's home. You know, PTSD is rampant among medical professionals. So are there any sort of um, workarounds to getting mental health treatment for doctors if they can't necessarily admit that they're feeling extremely depressed or thinking about harming themselves? What, what are ways that they can get that, that care and that attention without sort of being maybe blacklisted for doing so? Well, I think many of them go off the grid to get help. So they, I, I know a psychiatrist friend of mine drives 200 miles out of town and pays cash and uses a fake name, you know, to get mental health care. I mean, that's also insane, right? Absolutely. That we would ask medical professionals to do that. I mean, if we ask patients to pay cash, use a fake name and drive out of town to pay, you know, for their colonoscopies and other stuff, would <laughs> they do that? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, and they, that, that's a huge barrier, by the way. But that's what some doctors are doing. And other doctors honestly, are, you know, self-prescribing, whether it's, you know, medication that they prescribe, you know, via pharmacy or, you know, just drinking after work and, and, and doing, you know, other agents, which you would hope they wouldn't have to turn to, but because mm -hmm. they can't get legitimate help above the radar without fear of losing their entire careers or being punished publicly, flogged almost by the medical boards, you know, because their names would be listed on websites as sort of like needing help and having their license suspended and all this stuff. So they go underground doing these sorts of things like, you know, drugs, alcohol, just not getting treatment or sneaking out of town, you know, using a fake name. I mean... This is what's going on. It's terrible. I mean, some of them, you know, legitimately could be, you know, trying to get help from, say, their pastor at their church or other people that are not, like, writing anything down in a medical record. I think a lot of them sort of offload to their spouse their trauma, but that's going to ruin your marriage over time because there's a reason why you're an emergency doctor and your, you know, wife is a librarian. You know, like, mm -hmm. she's not interested in handling that high level of adrenaline, and you are. So if you offload any of this to your family, you'll probably undermine, you know, your relationship. I see, yeah. Um, another thing I, I was reading on your site um, it was the fact that uh, for every one female physician who dies by suicide, there are seven men who die. Um, and for some reason, male anesthesiologists seem to be at the highest risk. Um, do, you, do you have any explanation for maybe what dynamics are sort of leading to this or maybe how we can kind of help men maybe open up to being vulnerable enough to, to seek treatment or if that's the case? So part of this is because the practice of medicine is still skewed towards men. You know, I think more mm. practicing physicians are male than female, you know. Right. Um, so it would have a higher number of men just based on that. But I do think culturally men are groomed not to be quote-unquote weak and show their emotions and be the tough guys and the fix-it guys. And so even before medical school, they're taught sort of not to cry and not to, you know, share their emotions, mm -hmm. right? And then in medical school, that's just drilled into them even further. And so it's like the perfect storm where men don't reach out for help, whereas women, you know, might pick up the phone and cry with their girlfriend on the phone about something terrible that happened during the day. Men just sort of go home and stew on it mm -hmm. or maybe grab a gun or do something else, you know. Right. And the many male physicians that I've talked to who have actually survived against all odds their suicide um, attempts you know, they really should not be here because they made, you know, legitimate, effective attempts but came back to life. Uh, I did ask them, you know, gee, how much time was there between when you finally decided that you were going to die by suicide and when you actually, you know, made the move to do it? And it was like three to five minutes. Wow. So these are really impulsive decisions, which I think is more of a male trait as well, impulsivity, you know, sort of this testosterone-driven, you know, damn it, I've had enough <laughs> impulsivity sort of thing, you know. Um, and then, of course, I do think, you know, men are maybe more likely to grab the firearm, you know, than the woman. Um, 
And, you know, there's just certain ways that are a little bit different in how genders handle suicide. And um, I do think men are highly at risk uh, because of our culture, because of the medical culture, and because of, you know, just high testosterone. (laughs) And the other thing that leads, of course, male anesthesiologists to be at higher risk than other men is just easy access to a peaceful end. Uh You know, I mean, they see this right in front of them every day. The number of physicians who have told me that they're jealous of their, you know, terminal patients or patients who, you know, they're watching them peacefully sleep through surgeries, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're having a bad day, you could want to maybe switch places, right? And, you know, that, by the way, leads veterinarians to also have a high rate of suicide because they have an easy end as well, just like anesthesiologists. I see. Only they get paid terribly. You know, like, they don't get paid as well as anesthesiologists, and they have to see the end result of human psychology on animals, which is not good. You know what I mean? No, not at all. And euthanizing pets, you know, for a living is also traumatic. So, you know, you have to really feel badly for other health professionals, including veterinarians and uh, EMTs, who see terrible things all day long, and they're the first ones to tell families, their child died in a car accident and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I think we as the American public and physicians and health professionals need to open up to the idea that we've all been traumatized. I don't think anyone makes it through medical training without being traumatized in some way. And we need help, you know, so that we can be normal people on the planet and enjoy our lives, right? And, and, and deliver good care for our patients. Like, you're not going to be caring for somebody if, you're, if you've got PTSD and you're depressed and maybe thinking of suicide. You're probably not going to be that great of a doctor, you know? It's definitely the concept of, you know, you have to kind of have that self-care before you can provide that care to anyone else or, or love or right. whatever it's going to be. Right. And, and so you kind of, you touched on this a little earlier, you know, the notion that you can see in a, in a doctor's eyes when they're feeling suicidal, there's a certain um, lack of self there or they're kind of being dissociated from their own selves. Um, you, you mentioned it as being the, the notion of, uh, quote, happy doctor um, being the victim of suicide most often. It's the ones who hide their suffering so well. And I'm just sort of wondering, you know, how, how can other physicians or maybe coworkers approach someone who they suspect might uh, have these tendencies and, and how can they reach out to them and sort of give them the support and uh, resources that they need? Well, first of all, with the happy doctors that die by suicide, nobody really is going to know until it happens, which mm. is so sad. And that really calls for a prevention approach, you know, because you can't tell who half these doctors are going to be that die because they, they play a good game. You know what I mean? They're in disguise. They're, they're almost like... Um, exceedingly happy, you know, and cracking jokes with their patients and, you know, giving a thumbs up to the surgery team, you know, before they go in the back room and shoot themselves in the head. So I think this just requires, like, us to really care about each other like a family right now. The way medicine is taught in medical training, it's really much more of a um, competitive sport more than true collaboration. And if we allow people to compete to the point of total isolation from one another, you increase their odds of feeling, you know, um, you know, alone and making these desperate decisions. So I think from day one of medical school, people need to be, you know, welcomed. Hey, this is your family. We're brothers and sisters in medicine. We're, we're here to support you. Here's my cell phone number. Call me anytime. You know, that's what the dean should be saying of the medical school. That's, you know, we should create an environment where people are, you know, really helping one another and caring about one another and not just sort of competing for, like, who gets the best test score, you know. And they yeah. can, with the right leadership, create a safe, secure, loving family environment in medical school that will only improve patient care, you know, because let's just face it, like when you're cared for, you're going to be more likely to be able to give care to somebody else. Um, But as far as what you had mentioned, the looking into a physician's eyes and sort of seeing that vacant look, so that's more like PTSD. And um, if you see somebody that's suffering in any way, a colleague, just take them out to dinner, take them out to lunch, spend some time with them out of the office. I think, like, people would be very unlikely. I mean, it's so funny because sometimes these residency programs mandate these wellness lectures. I think it's really unlikely that somebody who's suffering 
is going to like shed a tear under the fluorescent lights of a mandated lecture mm, right. with their peers when the person who's writing their evaluation is sitting right in front of them. You know what I mean? You sort of need to go out to a restaurant <laughs> or you know go on you know out on a on a on a boating trip or do so get walk through the woods together. You know, get out of the hospital and clinic into a more normal location. Right? Sit in a city park on a bench. Right? And just actually talk like real people and say, hey, I had a tough week. You know, if you notice that somebody else is suffering, then I think a really good way to broach the topic is just to start first by telling them, like, hey, I had a tough week. Um, You know, I had a malpractice case in the past. I used to have panic attacks. You know, here's what I did to overcome it. Um, You know, how are you doing? You know, don't just start by prying into them. Be sort of self-revealing first, and that will open a door for them to potentially share with you their vulnerable feelings, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think that really goes along with um, something else that you mentioned is how the media really addresses, you know, this issue of physician suicides. It's a lot of the times when, um, you know, a, a physician takes their own life, it gets ruled out as just being, you know, no foul play. But really, it doesn't address this sort of underlying issue of of the real mental health involved. It's it doesn't. It's not a story that sells, in other words, right? So, right. I mean, it could sell if they would frame it properly. Right. But I think, unfortunately, there's so many forces at play that vilify doctors, so that uh, you know, there's a lot of people making a lot of short-term profit off of doctors, and I don't mm-hmm. think many of these uh, players necessarily want to empower the physicians they're profiteering off of, you know, sadly. Right. Um, but I do think, you know, we're all in this together. Everyone's going to need health care in their, in their life, and you just have to think, hey, you know, do I, Connor, want to be, you know, on a ventilator one day with a doctor who's, you know, hasn't slept in two days? Or do I want my grandma to be, you know, mm-hmm. in the emergency room with somebody making life and death decisions who's, who's not, you know, all there? And so even if you're not sort of a complete noble humanitarian, you know, in your interest, I think everyone has some self-interest. And I think this situation with so many doctors dying by suicide or living on the edge of PTSD and, you know, and all of this, I mean, everyone should be concerned even if just for self-interest. You know, mm-hmm. but hopefully you would be concerned because these are other human beings that cohabitate our planet, the planet, and they deserve to be treated fairly and humanely uh, because they have inherent worth on their own as loving, beautiful people who have been unfortunately damaged by their profession. Absolutely, that I couldn't have said it better. We've been speaking here with Dr. Pamela Weibel, um, America's leading voice for ideal medical care. Uh, Before we go, Dr. Weibel, would you like to add anything else about any uh, resources that you have available or any upcoming events, anything like that? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, anyone can contact me anytime through idealmedicalcare.org. Just click on the contact link. I email everyone back and call pretty much almost everyone back who contacts me. Um, I have a very low threshold for wanting to, um, you know, engage with people just because I know a lot of people, even in their emails that they send me, are really only, you know, touching the surface of their issues and there's a lot deeper things going on with most people and they need somebody to talk to. So I am here to talk to anyone, you know, any physician, nurse practitioner, PA, anyone who needs to talk. And then I have retreats multiple times per year. Would love to have anyone come out to a live event and just hang out with us where you can, again, heal in a sacred, safe location where you're not being, um, you know, nobody's going to tattle on you and, and, and sort of, you know, write you up as unprofessional for crying and things like that. And um, and I also can hook doctors up with therapists and, and such. You can see them confidentially via Skype um, and also phone consult. So, you know, at all hours so that they're not limited to having to go to somebody in their own town. You know, let's, let's just face it. I think doctors are a little nervous, especially in small towns, to be seen going into a psychiatrist's office, <laughs> you know, where word can spread that hmm, something might be wrong. Um, yeah, so I am here, and if anyone needs anything, I also have um, a book called Physician Suicide Letters Answered. It's on Amazon, but I also have a free audio download of that book on my website if anyone wants to listen to my voice for three hours, sort of, it's almost like a three-hour suicide hotline for doctors that is just sort of available for anyone who needs help uh, without having to necessarily, you know, call me, because some people are even nervous to, to let me know their names and 
they write me anonymously and they call me from unknown numbers where I can't call them back. So if you're somebody that wants help but doesn't necessarily feel safe enough to even engage with me, just download the free audio book of Physician Suicide Letters Answered, and that can help you, you know, in the privacy of your own home. So that's what I would suggest. Well, that's just an amazing amount of resources. Um, we'll have all of those linked below here on our site as well to help uh, spread these resources out throughout the internet and to everyone who needs them. Uh, Dr. Weibel, thanks so much for talking with us today. Really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks for your work as well. It's just so important. Thanks, Connor. Have a, have a wonderful day. And, and let me know if uh, I can help in any way. And, and by the way, you can call me Pamela. And um, I'm, I'm on a first name basis with everyone. And okay. So, if anyone needs to reach out, I'm, I'm actually very friendly. And <laughs> so just uh, give me a, yeah, and you can even call me, you know, at 541-345-2437 and I'll, and I'll get back to them definitely the same day. So, okay. Perfect. Thanks, Pamela. Have a great day okay, as well. Okay, take care. You too. Bye.